The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Powell fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypowell.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, I am very excited for this podcast. Uh, we got some really special guests with us. We're going to be talking about buprenorphine, lots of fun stuff. This was like the hot topic at AHPM. So Alex, hot. who do we have with us Couldn't today? get into the room, right? It was so hot. Yeah. Um, so we have Katie Fitzgerald Jones, who's a palliative care nurse practitioner and PhD candidate at Boston College. Welcome to the Jerry Pal podcast, Katie. Thank you. If I was a, a emoji right now, I'd be the Jonah Hill with his hands like this, screaming <laughs> with excitement to be here. That's great. <laughs> we have Zach Sager, who's a palliative care doc and psychiatrist at the Dana-Farber in VA Boston. Zach, welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. Thanks for having me and uh, really excited to talk about this. And we have Janet Ho, who's a palliative care clinician and attending physician at UCSF on the palliative care service and addiction medicine. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Janet. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having us here. So uh, I listened to the I listened to like three different talks at AHPM annual meeting about buprenorphine, including the precon. Yeah. I think during that time at the very end, Katie uh, mentioned about being on the Jerry Powell podcast and also already having a song request, if I remembered correctly. Uh, Katie, before we jump into the topic of buprenorphine in serious illness, um, what's the song request? So I have to thank Rochelle Bernacki for this because she told me the secret to getting on the Jerry Pal podcast is having a good song. So <laughs> I have thought about this for months, maybe years since your 2016 Sarah Cole blog. <laughs> um, but we have picked Under Pressure by David Bowie and Queen. And why Under Pressure? Because I think it reflects this tipping point in our field. Um, around opioid complexity and leaning into caring for people with serious illness that have concurrent opioid misuse or use disorder. And I also love the message at the end about, you know, can we give love? Because a lot of that speaks to the work that we're doing in harm reduction, which is really meeting people where they are, loving them where they are, and then not just leaving them there. That's a great message. That is great. So for those of you listening via YouTube, here's the live version. For those of you who are listening on the podcast, you're going to get my pre-recorded uh, version with lots of loops um, that I'm doing in consultation with my new music teacher, who's a music producer in LA. Um, so we'll see, see what these come out like. So uh, here we go. It's a little bit of under pressure. Pressure pushing down on me, pushing down on you, no man asked for. Under pressure that burns a building down, splits a family in two, puts people on the streets. It's a terror of knowing what this world is about. Watching some good friends scream, let me out, pray tomorrow takes me higher. Pressure on people, people on the streets. Na da da. Ice, ice, baby. <laughs> Couldn't help it. <laughs> At the end, you're going to do the whole vanilla ice song, right, Alex? <laughs> but it's slightly different. It's like, do na 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 Yeah, that's what vanilla reminds ice said. That's that. how he tried to get out of the lawsuit, right? I know. It reminds me of that MTV thing. <laughs> um, thank you, Alex. Um, you know, I'd like to start off just briefly talking with each of you. How how did you get interested in this topic of buprenorphine and serious illness? I'm going to start off with Katie. This is both a, a research and a clinical interest of yours, right, Katie? Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, I think where it started for me was that, um, you know, I've been in palliative care for a long time, um, as evidenced by my, you know, dedication to your podcast. But I, you know, was struck by caring for people with addiction, that they had suffering that we just entirely ignored. You know, it was, they were dying anyway, sort of mentality. So just give them what they want, you know, don't worry about their, you know, alcohol use or drug use, you know, gives them pleasure. But that just didn't really resonate with what I saw clinically, which was that there was lots of suffering, both in the patient, their family, and on the clinical team, and just felt like it was really this this space where I didn't have a lot of evidence to guide me. And also, quite honestly, I wasn't feeling like I was very good at it. Like I think Zach and I talk of stories about times where we were really messed up and haven't gotten it right. And so I think that drove me to research too, to feel like maybe if I had more empiric data to better understand how to best support people, um, I could then, you know, champion others to be better at it. And, and along the way I have since improved. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there are some old mantras in palliative care. Like if you're treating pain, you won't get addicted to it. That were clearly not rooted in the best evidence. Uh, Zach, or, Zach. Yeah. How about you? How did you get interested in this? Yeah. So, I mean, I did my med school and um, residency training in Louisville, Kentucky, and I had a second year med student lecture from Joe Rotella, who was, uh, I think, the chief medical officer at Hospice at the time. And we had a required palliative care rotation as a third year medical student. And kind of, I really loved palliative care and was like, I'm going to do this. Um, but I couldn't figure out what I was going to do before that <laughs> to get to that. Um, and psychiatry kind of felt like the thing that resonated. And during residency, I mean, this was also like, you know, in Kentucky, right at this, you know, intersection of um, Ohio, Indiana, um, Kentucky, West Virginia. And we were, I was seeing patients that were coming from Eastern Kentucky for addiction treatment, seeing patients that were coming out of these pill mills and just cared for a tremendous number of people who had um, opioid use disorder, opioid addiction, and was just wondering, like, I'm going to do palliative care. I'm going to take care of folks with pain, but I'm seeing these patients now. And what's going to happen when they develop cancers or serious illnesses in 10, 15, 20 years? And how am I going to manage their pain? Um, and so that was really kind of the impetus for figuring out, like, how do I figure out this intersection of substance use and pain? Because uh, it didn't feel like anyone was really doing it well and it was all just kind of you make it up as you go along yeah and janet you actually did a fellowship in addiction medicine right that's right <laughs> um yeah so i mean exactly in line with what katie and zach said i think it started out with just having the sheer luck of um having gone to residency at yale where there's a cadre of um attendings for whom um being able to treat opioid use disorder and consequences of long-term opioid use was just as important as knowing how to prescribe opioids kind of responsibly. And so that was my first taste of um, kind of addiction medicine. And it really sticks with you. I think um, both Katie, Zach, and I talk about just if you could see a patient um, being treated for opioid disorder and doing well, um, it's pretty life-changing, both for that patient and, and for yourself as a provider. Um, but subsequently, I went to um, MJ for fellowship in palliative care, which I knew I wanted to do. And I remember uh, being there, um, and there was a patient who had seen inpatient and then subsequently outpatient, who was so thankful in the weirdest, in just this like irrational way for um, having been diagnosed with liver cancer, it was this young man, he was like in his mid twenties and he was so thankful that he um, kind of ended up in this hepatic coma and got diagnosed with liver cancer because it was his chance to be linked to treatment for addiction, um, which is so extreme. And it's so um, kind of backwards when we know that there's really strong evidence um, for the different treatments that we have for addiction that people just don't have access to. Um, and so that kind of helped me think as a fellow that we should be able to offer this um, regardless of what type of clinician we are, that it's our responsibility, especially as opioid prescribers. And then part of our role as folks in palliative care who 
as Katie mentioned, really try to help folks um, manage distress around serious illness. Um, and so all of those things uh, motivated me to just learn as much as I can about treating addiction. And then now in thinking about it with colleagues who work kind of in the two areas is how do we take that addiction medicine knowledge and workflow and adapt it to, you know, caring for patients with serious illness, because it's not as simple as just transposing what they do in addiction medicine onto caring for patients with painful, serious illness. Yeah. What is the role for people caring for those with serious illness? Like they're not addiction medicine specialists. They're not They don't have an addiction clinic. Like it's not staffed that way. What is the role for those who are caring for seriously ill patients to know about addiction medicine and to like to care for these folks? Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, And I think that we would um, kind of enthusiastically say that it is definitely part of our role as palliative care clinicians to have a certain level of primary addiction medicine knowledge and competence. So as um, Julie Childers um, often says, you know, in the same way that as palliative care clinicians, we can take a first pass to try to address distress from depression without being necessarily mental health counseling specialists or psychiatrists, we should have that same level of familiarity and comfort um, in approaching, assessing, and offering treatment to somebody who has uh, a substance use disorder, and then knowing when to kind of reach out for co-management or when to reach out to specialists um, for kind of higher level care. Yeah. I mean, we do lots of really tough stuff in palliative care. And I often think about like in the scheme of hard things we do in palliative care, we're thinking about, you know, like managing patients in the ICU and using ketamine and methadone rotations, like identifying an opioid use disorder and starting buprenorphine is like not in the same ballpark as that. And is I think once you have some basic skills is is feels very within one's wheelhouse if you're willing to kind of make that step. Yeah. You know, I guess the, I mean, my my thought too is that there is this, especially for palliative care clinics where we're going farther and farther uphill, like what defines a serious illness? Like if somebody's dealing with a chronic pain and multiple chronic diseases, they have an opioid use disorder and we get referred that patient to a palliative care clinic. Is is that in our bailiwick? Is that, you think that's like a, is that something we're doing? Are we mainly thinking about, you know, in people with like advanced cancers? And I think this is one of the things that I struggle with the most is like, as we move closer, farther and farther away from like immediately dying patients, who are the right patients to serve in palliative care clinic? And who are the ones that we should also just make sure that they're getting the right places to refer, like pain clinic or addiction clinic? Thoughts on that, Katie? Yeah. Well, well first, I wanted to underscore something that both Jenna and Zach said, which is that this isn't hard and people yeah. get people get better. Like that's the part that really I struggle with a lot is I feel like in our field, there's like this therapeutic nihilism that people with opioid use disorder don't get better. You know, there was yeah. that New England Journal paper, harder to treat than leukemia. There was addiction as a terminal illness, you know, and, and there's this idea that, you know, you're, you're stuck with somebody with this untreatable condition, Mm -hmm. but prescribing buprenorphine alone improves mortality. So I think also just to say, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to connect with people and be able to meet their needs. Um, And I would say, you know, in response to your question, Eric, that I think for a lot of patients, you know, deciding if they meet, you know, our patient population, we often take a first pass and say, you know, I might, I might not be the person that can manage you, you know, for the next five years with your COPD, but like, let's just see how things are going, you know, what's causing you suffering right now. And if it's an opioid use disorder, start treatment and then transition them out of your clinic. And that's a lot easier if all providers were X waivered too. So I think one of the challenges is that 
the way that the climate is right now is that palliative care is becoming the default practice for opioid prescribing in general, right? Like nobody wants to prescribe opioids anymore, um, which is a problem. And I think if we advocate for opioid access, we should also be advocating for addiction access. So there's no like clear demarcation about, no. you know, who falls into serious illness care. I think Diane Meyer says whoever wants it. <laughs> so. And then let's talk about treatment. Um, we've mentioned buprenorphine. Is that kind of the 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 main thing that we should be thinking about in palliative care clinics and geriatric clinics for people with opioid use disorder? I think it's important. And I want to jump back just to highlight kind of who the patients are. Because I think when we are in palliative care, like I'm mostly in a palliative care clinic setting, both in the VA and then at Dana-Farber. So seeing a non-onc population at the VA and an onc patient at Dana-Farber. And that when someone comes to me with a diagnosis of opioid use disorder, like it is much easier. You know, you kind of like have an idea of where you're going to start. The patient has some like shared understanding of like what the issues are. And so it's really much more straightforward to collaborate with them about thinking about how you're going to manage their pain and their suffering. I think where we are and where the, you know, the kind of bigger pot of patients we care for in palliative care is like patients who maybe meet the opioid use disorder diagnosis at some times or or like have aspects of it that seem, you know, like they align with opioid use disorder, but other parts that don't. So it's kind of this like middle ground patient population that we wind up caring for and identifying an opioid use disorder, maybe over time. But it takes sometimes like multiple visits, months or longer sometimes to be able to first identify, you know, actually what's going on. Um, and then I think in that, then buprenorphine becomes like a really important tool that we can use as palliative care providers because some of the other addiction treatments are just not going to work for our patient yeah. population. And are there any good assessments for opioid use disorder that you know our, our listeners could use? Um, there are, but just to kind of piggyback off kind of what Katie and Zach are saying, back to your question of, you know, I think as palliative care grows um, and heads upstream yeah. on the one end, and as it is extended on the other end with, you know, all these disease-directed therapies and people are living longer, that gray area where we're, we know that people who um, have serious illness and get touched by palliative care tend to end up on opioids and tend to end up on opioids for a long time, lends itself to added clinician distress um, with what to do with those opioids, especially um, concerning behaviors or concerning use of opioids that might arise. And buprenorphine is this great tool that's underutilized that can help both the clinician um, with that distress and with the patient. Um, so for instance, you know, should it be used as a first line kind of um, analgesic for somebody, especially um, when they come in and they're really young? Should it be used more often on the tail end as um, people are survivors of yeah. cancer um, to minimize kind of the harms from exposure to full agonist. And then how do we use it kind of in between for people who are in this gray area of either some opioid misuse or some concerning use or with frank opioid use disorder. I think that's um, the beauty of buprenorphine is that it um, really lends itself to all of these different places um, as our patient pool grows. So let's talk about buprenorphine. Before we do, just want to say, is there a good assessment that we could do for uh, opioid I use think, disorder? I think to Janet, Janet highlighted a couple, which um, is, is um, you know, typically we use the, the four Cs, which is use um, despite consequences, loss of control, um, cravings, and um, compulsive use. So those are those are sort of the acronym mm -hmm. to remember. But I also think to what Janet and Zach said, a lot of our patients kind of fall into this gray area. Some people call it complex persistent opioid dependence, which is, you know, sort of they're, they, they're on opioids. They're not, it's not going well. They have poor pain. They have poor function. But you also can't clearly make a diagnosis. Um, and for those patients, it's, it, you know, it, that's like when your gut is telling you it's ill-advised to continue full agonist. Yeah. And, and in that case, buprenorphine is really helpful. And sometimes you can make a use disorder diagnosis in hindsight. Like it really becomes clear all the things that were causing chaos and problems sort of dissolve as you uh, use buprenorphine and the cravings stop. Mm. 
So let's talk about buprenorphine. So, um, Janet, what is buprenorphine? <laughs> you said it's not an agonist. What is it? Um, yeah, so buprenorphine is a mu opioid um, partial agonist. Or it's a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. Um, and so that lends it um, properties of being a pretty strong analgesic. Um, and it lends it special properties um, for safety, uh, from a safety profile. Um, and so being a partial agonist, it just means that there's a certain threshold where beyond that, if you continue to increase the buprenorphine, you will hit a ceiling um, or a limit to um, adverse effects at the mu opioid receptor, such as respiratory depression, um, such as potentially constipation, such as um, kind of cognitive impacts. Um, and then excitingly for buprenorphine, um, it also has some action at other opioid receptors. So it's a delta, um, or it's a kappa receptor antagonist, um, which is thought to reduce its effects on kind of euphoria and cravings with opioids and also to help um, reduce things like depression and hyperalgesia. Um, and so those are kind of some unique properties um, for buprenorphine that we don't uh, quite have with our other full agonists. And I feel yeah, like I'm going to do better on my boards now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Wait, so it's a, let me just summarize, make sure I get it for our listeners because this is pretty key. It's a mu agonist and a kappa antagonist. That's right. It's a specifically it's a very high affinity um, mu opioid receptor partial agonist. Partial agonist, which means that there's a ceiling effect as far as side effects from um, uh, that you normally see with opioids. And then That's it also great. doesn't cause the same degree of euphoria that other opioids would that opioids would cause. Right. And it's, um, I think there are some studies to examine whether um, it can help kind of with mood and depression as well. Mm -hmm. Is it an opioid? Go ahead, Alex. Oh, is it an opioid? It is an opioid. It is. Okay. Yes. So So at the end of the day, it's a pretty potent opioid. And I think, you know, the natural next question is, Um, when you hear a partial agonist and ceiling effect is people wonder whether that translates to pain and analgesia. Um, And I'll just say that from what we know from both animal studies, as well as human studies, like in um, patients who are post-op from GI procedures or in women who are post-C-section, that it's a pretty effective um, opioid analgesic. Mm. Um, And so there's no evidence um, thus far that, you know, there is a ceiling effect on the analgesic properties of um, buprenorphine. That said, I think there might be some like anecdotal reports of, um, you know, how effective it can be for somebody with rapidly escalating pain, for example, like terminal pain or um, with rapidly progressing disease. But for the most part, I think for most of our uses, um, we should consider it um, no less than any other opioid. Thank you. And and go ahead ahead to that last point too. So, you know, one of the older school mantras was that with a partial high affinity, partial agonist, like if we're admitting somebody to hospice, we think their pain is going to get worse, that it actually may be harder to treat their pain with other short acting uh, opioids if they're on a partial agonist that has high affinity for those mu opioids. So like buprenorphine, you know, immediate release oxy or morphine may not work as well if they're on like a, a patch of buprenorphine. Is, is that true? I, see I mean, well, you know, there's, it's, I think there's one important part is that there is, there's like a ton of formulations of buprenorphine. And so when we, you know, um, which, you know, we, we, I see this clinically that someone, I have someone who is on a five microgram buprenorphine patch, which is like a really low dose intended for people who are otherwise opioid naive. And that's really different from a, someone who's in, um, you know, addiction treatment and is on 24 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. And so they're, you know, adding a full agonist to both those patients is going to look different. But I think most people see buprenorphine and see, oh, this is an opioid, you know, they think like, oh, this is an opioid blocker. They can't, they're not going to get good treatment or good effect with a regular opioid, you know, which is 
which is not true. So, you know, I think a lot of the time we're fighting which formulation someone's on. And, you know, for particularly like on patients on hospice, you know, sometimes they stay on, like I've had patients on hospice who have stayed on buprenorphine until the very end of their life and, and, and it works fine. Sometimes we make the decision that we like, that the buprenorphine is no longer indicated and we can switch to a full agonist and they do well with just a, a like a regular dose of, you know, kind of a regular starting dose of a full agonist. Or sometimes we wind up kind of layering on a full agonist and then like, that dose gets fairly high and we take off the, the buprenorphine. Um, so there's not like one pathway to like that for folks on buprenorphine. And I think that's one of the things that makes it awesome that it comes in all these different formulations with all these different indications, but also the thing that makes it really it's scary. Um, yeah, scary or like a tricky thing for folks to navigate, especially when they're starting out. In, um, in general, that you have whether or not it's given through a patch or v- via, you know, other routes and also whether or not it's given with naloxone or not, right? Well, I want to just make a, a strong point that the patch is never going to block anything because it's just so small. Yeah. So that's just, it's, uh, somebody could be on the highest dose patch and it wouldn't block anything. It's micrograms compared to milligrams doses of Suboxone. So I do think it's really important just to say that. Um, and um, and that's what was the, the other? The, the Butrans patch, is that right? The Butrans patch. And that comes in, what doses are we usually starting people in? Five, and then it can go to 10, uh-huh. 15, 20. And in Europe, they use higher doses than 20, but 20 is the highest we go. Could I clarify what you mean there by it's not going to block anything? What What do you mean specifically by anything? <laughs> I, I mean, I think there is this idea that buprenorphine blocks the effect of other opioids and again, I think as Janet was alluding to, I think that's an area of unsettled science. Like I think that we don't, in, in for example, in the post-operative literature, people that remain on their buprenorphine for opioid use disorder use less as opioids and have better pain control when their buprenorphine is continued. Mm. Um, so I think that uh, similar to what Eric was describing, you know, 10 years ago, I was stopping buprenorphine and adding a full agonist because I was worried or I was using high doses of full agonists because I thought maybe buprenorphine was, you know, impacting its efficacy, but that that's not so, what we see in the literature. So what you're saying is it's not going to block the analgesic properties if you add another opioid on top of the buprenorphine patch. Correct. So but let me ask you will this. Still, w- will it still act at the kappa antagonist to block the feelings of euphoria associated with the additional opioid you give your patient? I don't think we would um, see, I think the the evidence for the kappa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Janet, but this is normally with higher doses with Suboxone. So I think as as everyone's pointing out, like part of the tricky uh, nature of buprenorphine is that it's used in so many different ways uh, for so many different indications. And I think what's helpful to know um, as a palliative care clinician is that we have maybe what we consider lower dose formulations of buprenorphine, um, which include the patch, which um, is, comes in like the lowest dose. Um, Those are micrograms per hour, right? We're talking about exactly. five, We're talking 10 about- <laughs> micrograms per hour. Right, um, which some people might consider even just like a homeopathic dose, but for someone who's naive, like that might be where you start. Um, and so it goes from, from five to 20 or even with two patches up to 40. And then on the lower end of the um, dosing still is the buccal formulation of buprenorphine, um, which is also FDA approved for pain, just like the patch are, um, just like the patch is. And so the buccal kind of, crosses over from this low dose where the patch ends to slightly higher dose. Um, And then what we consider moderate to high dose would be the sublingual versions. So those um, might be the formulations that come with the naloxone as a combination product, or they are also available as a mono product. And those tend to start um, at the two milligram dosing level, and then can go up to like 24 or 32 milligrams a day. And I think what Zach was saying is that, um, you know, the level of this 
hypothetical blockade of the opioid receptors by this high affinity buprenorphine really varies whether you're on this low end like patch or buckle formulation versus if you're at like 24 or 32 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine a day. Um, and so just, I guess, as additional context that I found helpful, um, you know, when we treat addiction, we aim for um, somewhere between 16 to 24 milligrams of buprenorphine a day to help block cravings um, and to help maintain stability. And for patients with pain or chronic pain, um, they tend, you, you, you might get an effect, um, like a really good analgesic effect at much lower doses. Um, so it might be with a patch that's like 20 micrograms day, or it might be like on four to six milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. Um, instead of at the mm. 24 to 32. It reminds me of methadone where lower doses can be effective for pain and much higher doses oh, are absolutely. used to treat. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's helpful to kind of think about, you know, because there's so many, because there's different formulations, there's other formulations that are not used by palliative care um, that, you know, I just, I will sometimes have like an image of like the a composite patient for each of the indications. And so for, you know, my like composite of a patient who comes to me in palliative care clinic who would end up on a low dose transdermal buprenorphine product would be, you know, an older patient who's maybe had a poor experience with like 2.5 or 5 of oxycodone um, or doesn't, has had a, you know, comes to me and says they've had a history of not tolerating uh, other opioids. Right. They're or, like asleep for a week after 5 of oxycodone. Yeah. Or someone who like really doesn't want to take medicine, but has chronic pain and, um, um, you know, Tylenol and ibuprofen is not cutting it. And so that would be the patient who I would think, okay, this person, I'm going to start at five of transdurable buprenorphine somewhere. And they're going to end up somewhere in this five, 10, maybe 15 microgram range. In and fact, also yeah, that it would be ideal for like an older adult because it's every seven days and they don't have to remember to take it if, um, you know, for example, they have a cognitive impairment. Exactly. And five would be kind of your starting dose of buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another question real quickly. So imagine that same patient, Zach, but they're, they're already on opioids. Do you have to worry at all at those very lower doses? Like, are they going to, you know like detox from their opioids no. if you put them yeah. on? Uh... No, that's a great question. I used to stress about that, even though when I knew like they wouldn't, yeah. de- you know, they wouldn't have it. I remember like, you know, the first couple patients who I would rotate from a full agonist over to a transdermal buprenorphine product because they just weren't tolerated in full agonist. You know, I'd be talking with Katie or Janet and like, you know, just checking that this was okay. Um, so no, I mean, we know because the dose is low and we also use that, you know, as a, we use the patch as a way to also kind of get people on to a higher dose form because it's a slow onset. And so, you know, if you are, the general rule of thumb is if you're opioid naive or maybe taking like, you know, one tramadol every three days or, uh, um, you know, really low dose of oxycodone, that's not cutting it every few days, that person is going to start on five micrograms. If someone's on a low dose of a full agonist, you know, like you know, maybe a total of like five, 15, 20 OMEs a day, they're going to start on 10 milligrams or 10 micrograms, sorry, of the patch. And then, you know, for patients who are on a little bit higher, I might start a little bit higher on the patch, but, you know, often I'll still start on the 10 microgram patch. Um, and I would generally say if someone's on a full agonist, you know, put on the patch, you know, take your normal opioid dose, see how you feel like an eight, 12 hours. If you need to take another breakthrough dose, if you're old full agonist, um, do that. And then, you know, after about 12, 24 hours, you'll kind of get a sense of if this dose is going to be effective or not. Um, and I would say most patients, you know, who have, that have transitioned from a low dose of a full agonist onto transdermal buprenorphine find that, and it didn't really do anything for the first eight, 12 hours, which makes sense because it's a transdermal product. But then after about 12 hours or a day or a day and a half, then they're kind of noticing that it's kicking in and then they're taking less of their full agonist and eventually, you know, if the goal is they eventually stop. So five naive, 10, if they have a little bit of opioids in their system is kind of how I will teach it. Super and it helpful. does take up, it does take like 72 hours to reach steady state, but you know, like fentanyl, I think that we see people have it kick in a little bit earlier than that, but there's, 
it won't precipitate withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really the question that you're asking um, or alluding to is that, um, you know, perhaps in many of our clinical training, we've come across um, some amount of buprenorphine training um, and kind of the take home is always like, watch out for precipitated withdrawal. If someone's on a full opioid agonist and you add buprenorphine, because it's a high affinity opioid, it's going to kind of displace or outcompete the full agonist. And then because it's a partial agonist, it might exert only part of the opioid effect that the person was not getting before. And that delta, um, that shift in opioid load is going to feel like precipitated withdrawal. Um, and because of that phenomenon, um, a lot of the initiation for especially higher dose buprenorphine starts with people stopping their full agonist, entering kind of withdrawal, and then getting rescued from that when you give them buprenorphine. Uh, but what Zach and Katie are referring to is, you know, this new, newer method um, called low dose initiation, um, or you might see it called microdosing, um, wherein you just introduce like tiny, tiny amounts of buprenorphine separated by enough time such that it slowly, slowly builds up um, and doesn't cause that rapid shift. Mm. And so you end up um, kind of with the staggered cross taper where you introduce little bits of buprenorphine up to a certain threshold, and then you can take off the full agonist and then continue to titrate up the buprenorphine with really minimal risk of causing precipitated withdrawal. And so one of the methods um, that's kind of the most patient friendly for doing this is actually using that um, buprenorphine patch. That do you need an X waiver for a buprenorphine patch? We do not. We do not. Why is that? Why, why do some formulations you need an X waiver and some you don't? Racism. Stigma. Stigma. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think I, I think this is uh, like really the call to action that we hope to make. You know, from this podcast is that these policies are not evidence based at all. This like delineation of you can use the same medication for one indication without training and another indication you need training is just, you know, it's, it's really just steeped in stigma and racist drug policies. And, you know, we believe that anyone prescribing opioids should have their X waiver because as we're describing, it's not as simple, right? It's not so simple as saying, you know, this person clearly has an opioid use disorder. This person clearly has pain. That is a false dichotomy. You can have pain and addiction, and most people with addiction have chronic pain. Yeah, it's it, like using buprenorphine is much easier. The hard, the, the, I think the challenging is, is kind of feeling confident enough to start the medication and making the diagnosis. You know, I, I think identify, like gathering the evidence in order to identify kind of, okay, this is what I think is going on. And then be, you know, have the patient buy in to say like, I really think that this is the problem in a, you know, uh, the the use of the substance in conjunction with pain. And so I think we're going to shift how we're thinking about treating it to use this product, if that's what the decision is. I think that is the much harder part than just the kind of, you know, pharmacokinetics of, or figuring out how to use buprenorphine. Right. And, you know, just to highlight that when we are able to offer buprenorphine as treatment for opioid use disorder, or for somebody who's, um, you know, having concerning opioid use, like we're fitting into this larger social movement of um, harm reduction, which Katie had mentioned in the beginning, which is really meeting a patient where they're at and giving them the tools and empowering them um, to improve how they can take care of their health. Um, and so this is like one way that as palliative care clinicians, we can proactively fight against like this whole legacy of really discriminatory and racist um, policy within the U.S. Um, towards uh, addiction, towards people who use drugs, and then even towards the medications that we can use to treat this, right? Um, and so we have this whole spectrum of buprenorphine at these different doses that we should be able to utilize, but people can feel limited just because of this X waiver um, policy to not fully access and be able to offer um, all of the medications. Um, and there's no excuse for that now because, you know, as of this year, it is so simple to get the X waiver. It is. How do you get an X waiver? I'm glad you asked. 
because it's like an eight minute process instead of an eight hour process. Oh. For, yes. All you have to do is sign up with like one click. Um, so you go to the um, website, the SAMHSA website, and you fill in like... Um, you can one- even just go to getwaver.com and it will bring you right there and show oh. you a video that, that, that moves your mouse for you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then you literally answer some demographic questions of who you are and then it gets sent in and then they'll send you your X waiver kind of number um, like 30 to 40 days later. And you don't have to be limited by these arbitrary policies anymore. The waiving of the education requirement is for physicians, nurse practitioners and PAs. But in some states, um, nurse practitioners require their physician to be waivered if they ha- or live in a reduced or um, restricted scope of practice. So more argument for team-based care. And then if somebody wants to learn more about buprenorphine and serious illness, like details, getting to dosing, different types, is there like a good review article that, that we should turn our listeners to? I mean, all of our, all of our papers. <laughs> Great. There's <laughs> so a lot of links facts. to some of your papers. <laughs> yeah. um, um, uh, well, we have a fast facts uh, now for um, the traditional method of buprenorphine initiation. Um, again, I think there's sort of uh, some of this, as Zach was describing, is around philosophy. You know, how can I best care for people um, at the intersection of serious illness and pain and opioid misuse use disorder. And so we have another paper on that. And then in terms of just practically how to use buprenorphine, um, you know, again, I think I I would get your feet wet in terms of both trying it for pain and opioid use disorder, because when you use it for all of the indications, you just get more comfortable with the products in general. And Katie has a great CAPC blog too, that kind of summarizes a lot of additional evidence and references um, online if you have access to that too. And we all have links to that. I got one more lightning question. Janet, you're at UCSF, you're caring for a patient in the hospital who's, let's say, on buprenorphine. And do you think anything differently about how to manage like acute pain in those patients? Do you think anything different about how to like what immediate release medication you're going to use to? if their pain is being, let's say, getting worse from metastatic cancer? Yeah, um, great question. I think it goes back to kind of what Zach was saying is like, one, how much, what dose are they on? Um, yeah. So they're, if they're on a higher dose, like 16 to 24 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. Instead of like a five microgram per hour patch, right? Five, <laughs> you're basically saying ain't doing anything, right? <laughs> if someone's on a patch, yeah, exactly. Um even up to 20, I would just treat them the way that I, I would, I would approach treatment the way that you normally would. Uh-huh. Um, if somebody's on higher, like 16 to 24 sublingual, um, I might use a breakthrough opioid um, at a higher frequency or at a higher dose than I would normally start. Would you use one that potentially has a higher affinity um, to the opioid receptor? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, if I'm able to, I mean, in the inpatient setting, like IV hydromorphone tends to have a higher affinity. Um, fentanyl has a higher affinity. Yeah. That said, you know, if we're in the outpatient setting or if that's not available, you can get the same analgesic effect with morphine and oxycodone. You just need higher doses or maybe a higher frequency of treatment. Uh-huh. And, I, um, and I might I might also just ask the patient in your history of receiving opioids when you have had pain, which is the medication that seems to work the best for you um, and use that as a starting place. You can also inquire with them, you know, has there been a medication that has been, you know, either triggering for you in terms of thinking about your past use, or is there one that you really is important for you to stay away from? If we're talking about someone who's on a buprenorphine product because of an opioid use disorder um, and not a kind of a, you know, chronic pain. Absolutely. I think, and I think a mistake would be to stop the buprenorphine. If they were on buprenorphine for an opioid use disorder, um, don't stop it. Like you wouldn't stop somebody's insulin. You know, I, I, it's just really important to keep it. And I think Zach and I have, you know, frequently share patients and we have had really challenge challenges where the buprenorphine was stopped and it's hard to get people back on it. Um, for various reasons, but, you know, really continuing that life-saving medication 
And if you need to reduce the dose, you can, but in a lot of instances, you might not even have to. And just remember that naloxone part of the buprenorphine slash naloxone isn't doing anything unless the person injected it. Right. Yeah. So especially in the kind of perioperative period, I think um, before kind of the current ev evidence that was available, people would kind of routinely stop the buprenorphine because of these worries about blocked receptors. Um, but now we know, and even here at UCSF, kind of the periop guidelines are continue the buprenorphine for stability, reduce it on the day of the procedure if necessary, just to allow for theoretically more full agonist to work and then kind of up titrate the bup. Um, as people recover. Well, um, I also just want to say one more last thing about buprenorphine. I, I know we're out of time, but um, my, one of my favorite dementia articles was a stepwise pain protocol for individuals with dementia. And it started off with Tylenol, then it went to low-dose morphine. And the third step was transdermal buprenorphine at 10 micrograms. Yes. And that pain protocol significantly reduced behavior behavioral issues in dementia in nursing home patients. I always thought like this article came out 2011. So this is like 2008 when they were running this study. I'm like, why did the heck did they choose buprenorphine? Nobody uses buprenorphine. And now I think, oh my God, buprenorphine. We should be using more buprenorphine. Like that's <laughs> perfect for this like setting in this population. Does that seem right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's an old medication. Yeah. But I mean, it was good. developed in the, it was developed in the 19, mid 1960s. It started being used for addiction treatment in the, you know, the seventies at the addiction research center in like in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. Um, so it's been around for ages. Like we're not, you know, I mean, this is new to palliative care and kind of relatively new to a lot of medicine, but this is like an old drug. Yeah. Um, is, is it inexpensive? It should be. It's <laughs> depends on the formulation. Okay. How about I, I transdermal? The transdermal is not cheap. Yeah, you. Oh, I often have to get a. I mean, I'm at the VA, so I'm spoiled. But um, you know, you often have to get a prior authorization. But for opioid use disorder, since the Affordable Care Act, it's automatically covered. So all a buprenorphine uh, naloxone is covered it ha by law. Yeah, I, I would say that shifting from, you know, I used to prescribe solely in the VA and the Shangri-La that is the VA, and then, you know, never had to worry about it. And then shifting to outpatient at a cancer center and having to go, you know, bill through commercial insurance. It has been, you know, it often needs a prior op, but I have been surprised that it hasn't been, the insurance hasn't been the barrier that I thought it would be. Mm. Sometimes there are other barriers, you know, like the, the local pharmacy doesn't have a doesn't have it in stock, or there's some oh. confusion about the indication. Um, so sometimes there's other additional barriers, but that I haven't found, at least in the patient population that I'm serving, at, you know, at Dana Farber, that cost of the patch hasn't been a, a major barrier to using it, yeah. which has been good. But maybe some other things that put you under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to say, um, in a related point, you know, if that. If that person with dementia, you know, maxed out at a 20 microgram patch, uh, that you can use the um, buprenorphine naloxone product off label for chronic pain. And this is done all the time in the general population. Um, and again, those doses equivalents are so different, but I would normally start somebody on, you know, half a film twice a day uh, for chronic pain if they were tolerant or two milligrams. So the doses aren't going to be quite as high as that 16 milligram, you know, typically um, for opioid use disorder, but that that, you know, you can go up. So yeah. don't sort of stop just because the indication for the patch stops at 20. And the, in the FDA approval for patch is 20 microgram, but in Europe, they use up to a 70 microgram patch. And, so, and the reason that 20 is the highest is because of a concern for QT prolongation. So there's not something magical that happens, you know, by your QT, uh, you know, when you cross the Atlantic. So, you know, I have had this success, you know, in the VA and then after, outside the VA, basically saying like, you know, petitioning to go above the FDA approved limit. Um, because I, I think that concern around QT prolongations is not really a clinically significant one, especially when we've got patients on like all sorts of other QT prolonging stuff. But do remember if you do 
not cross the Atlantic, but cross the threshold of over two milligrams of buprenorphine, that's when you have to worry about adding it to a full agonist and precipitating withdrawal. So you can do, you can add full agonist to buprenorphine, but you can't do the opposite order. Um, with higher doses. Precipitate and is there any opioid equal analgesic? Like if you want to, <laughs> somebody's on a buprenorphine dose, you want to figure out what is a good dilated dose for them. I mean, my my hot take is those equal analgesic tables are trash. Um, we have a podcast coming I, up with uh, on equal analgesic Ruzo. tables. And so, there's a great Pally Med blog about it recently. I mean, yep. not to, that's why we invited Drew. That's to why the it's podcast. coming. Oh. We're going to talk Drew about Marilyn that. McPherson. I, I love mean, it. So much of you know the the I'll just say like a plug for the some of these old studies are great. So there's these old Janisky Janisky Jasinski studies that were done at the Addiction Research Center in in Lexington, Kentucky. So those were the that they were studying the use of buprenorphine and they were giving patients who were incarcerated with opioid use disorder giving them buprenorphine to see if it would work. And they, you know, those were the studies where they really started to develop the kind of equal analgesic dose or what was the dose of buprenorphine that would block morphine, which is not our patient population. <laughs> and yeah. so like some of these numbers have been carried forward and copied, you know, like over decades. So ignore them. Ignore, in my way, I always tell to just ignore the tables. The equal analgesic tables for buprenorphine to a full agonist is going to get you in trouble. We're going to confuse you. Just ignore them. And it's always uh, just fascinating. Like you can have somebody on 400 of morphine MMEs and they're like the best they've ever been on, you know, six milligrams of bup. It doesn't make any sense. So just titrate it to the patient. Yeah. I, think I could talk for another three <laughs> hours on this. Um, I really want to thank all of you here. I know Alex has to run, so I'm putting him under pressure. So I'm going to try that again. <laughs> Alex, do you want to give us more under pressure? A more. Pressure pushing down on me, pushing down on you, no man asked for. Under pressure that burns a building down, splits a family in two, puts people on the streets. It's a terror of knowing what this world is about. Watching some good friends scream, let me out, pray tomorrow takes me higher. Pressure on people, people on the streets. Da da da. Ice, ice, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a very high song. Thank you for that, Katie. <laughs> Sorry, Freddie Mercury. Is a tough one. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> well, um, uh, I really want to thank you guys, Zach, Janet, Katie, for being on this podcast. I think that was absolutely fabulous. I think we're going to have to have you on again because I could talk in it for another couple hours about this subject. But a, a very, very big thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And it sounds like if there's one request for our listeners. For those clinicians, it's get an X waiver, right? Absolutely. X waiver doc. Wait, yeah. what is it? Get waiver. Get waiver. Dot com. com. Encourage all our listeners to go there, um, and we'll have links to some more papers um, by this group on our Jerry Pal website. And with that, uh, we'd like to thank all of our listeners and Archstone Foundation for your continued support. We'd also like to acknowledge the generous support for our Jerry Powell listeners who've donated over $250 each to support the Jerry Powell podcast. Including Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulski, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Mary Ann Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lundeberg, Gail Cooney, David Schiffeling, Cheryl Phillips, and Jessica Eng. Thank you very much.